Welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. My name's Peter Bond. I've read every book in the main series, but my co-hosts are reading the series for the first time. With me today is my friend and closest confidant, India Jones. Hello, all. Our producer, AJ Faleri. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and pork fried rice and a quart of wonton, it's Josh Baker. Yo, fucking, I was going to say take me out to dinner first, but done. Ready to go now. <laughs> Today on the show, we're talking about chapters four, five, and six of The Bone oh, Hunters. Whoa, whoa. Pete, that nickname comes from my lovely brother, Lou Falleri. Thanks for <laughs> giving the nickname. Thanks, Lou. And for donating to the show. More importantly... Are you, you guys fri- see- are you guys fried rice people or low main people? I'm a low main bitch. I'm just a through plain through. rice person. <gasps> Ew. Sorry, I get plain rice, but I usually get the General Tso's chicken, so I mix it up with the sauce and stuff. Oh, look at... Oh, God, your poor taste buds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have a refined I agree. palate. Odge, not the order I would go with, but the plain rice is a solid pick. Thank you. I disagree. I'm with you, Josh. A little man all the way. Oh Thank you. Gosh. We got a rice cooker recently. It's changed. It's changed my life. Our rice oh, always you mean, comes you out can't, good. You got to have a rice cooker. What up? It what comes out good. Like, we got one for $15. Crazy. Wait, yeah. can you make all kinds of rice with that? Like Spanish rice? Uh, it just. Yeah, I've, 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 no, I've, I've made Spanish rice in my rice cooker. It comes out nice. There you go. That's really good to know, because I can't make yeah. rice. Every time I make it, I fuck it up. Yeah. I, I got so tired of being bad at it when I lived with Peter. Like, I, I fucked up rice every single week, it felt like. And that, that was like, is... one of the first first things I bought when I got my, when I got a job was a rice cooker. I was like, I've made it. Every yeah. time you... I make it, it's just like congealed. Like, it's just like mm-hmm. like a bowl of oatmeal in there. Yeah. The, the, my, hottest, my hottest tip is to just get the cheapest rice cooker you can find because they all work on the same technology. Okay, cool. I'm going to look into guys, that. G- guys, we didn't even... I had a fun intro I was going to do, but sorry, this, is, this is better. This is fine. You know, I love... You know, I worked at a, play, a Chinese place for a while. Sounds great. We can get into it, but... But? <laughs> what was your intro? All I was going to say is I think I introduced what chapters we were reading and mm-hmm. that's and, only, I've completely stopped doing that. I haven't introduced the, what the book is, who Steven Erickson is, the chapters we're reading. I've stopped for dozens of episodes now. You know, well, no, you're nothing if not no. consistent. Really? Are you sure? I just feel like I hope this isn't the episode people are starting with. <laughs> Well, that would be, sorry to say, psychotic. If this is the yeah, episode people yeah. decided to just pick up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or if they pick it up and have no idea what this show is. If this is your first episode ever, you, you just yeah. can't, you just can't hope, do that. I I'm hope sorry. you like Chinese food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's who about doesn't? two sisters and one of them kills the other one without knowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We're feeling frisky today. Um, before we... One again to chapter four. Just wanted to plug Mugu Gai Pan, the best what dish is, to order. What is Mugu Gai Pan? I always, I always wonder, what is it? You should just order it and trust me, bro. Trust me, that's the good stuff. Okay, that's really I'm, just, good. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna I've never even heard of that. Mugu and Gai Pan. People don't want to order it because they don't know what it is. Right, but oh, that it's very good. It's really a great. It's a great dish. You know, it doesn't get enough love. That's my yeah. opinion. It's just or chicken and veggie joint. and sauce. Is there fish in it's, it? It's yeah. That's like it, well, when you just put it that way derisively. You know, I'm not saying derisive. I think it looks good. It's delicious. Yeah. Anyway, AJ, how's this for radio? Is this this good? is great? I I worked at the same Chinese place that Pete did because Pete got me a job there. Uh, and you were was... you worked there fleetingly compared to my senior tenure. Okay, but I worked there. <laughs> Don't gatekeep my job history, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it, it is true. AJ did work there uh, fleetingly, but it was fleetingly. great. Let it be known. Anyway, let's start the show now that I've tried to belittle AJ for no reason. (laughs) I'm so tiny. Sorry, buddy. Let's get it going. (laughs) Chapter 4. Map Bonacarium come across a crevasse and delve within it. They find a Kachain Chamal sky keep, along with a short-tailed corpse and a flying machine within an icy lake. Mappo is worried about Akarium and the Sky Keep, but they decide to explore it within. A monastery to the Worm of Autumn, Drek, is the site of a great slaughter. Everybody within is dead. Cutter and company come across it. 
Allison asks if Scalar will take care of her. Then they speak together of Bitathol, Greyfrog, and Felicin's mother. Then a portal opens up and a Segula appears. He tells Haboric everybody in this realm is dead. He is the soldier of High House Death and salutes Haboric. They speak about the tyrant of Darugistan, the Cabal, and then he leaves. Cutter thinks that he must go home. Map and Akarium find a strange, gravity-defying passageway as they continue to explore the Sky Keep. Deep within, they find a dragon impaled on it. Incarium knows it as the dragon that was once aspected to the Warren of Sky. Apslar travels through the Shadow Warren and finds Urko crust in his Tower of Fossils. Urko first thinks she is Cotillion's daughter, but realizes his mistake. They speak deeply then of the man Urko knew as Dancer and who she knows as Cotillion. Urko thinks Cotillion would keep his word and eventually leave her alone if she finishes his tasks. Dejimna Brawl hunts and Terlak Veed is not far behind him. Skalara has morning sickness and Greyfrog watches. After she speaks with Cutter about his tasks, God, and women. Greyfrog speaks with Felis and Younger. Everybody is having bad dreams and danger is coming for them. Far across the desert, Leoman and the remaining rebels come to the city of Yucatan. After being disrespected by the Falad of the city, Leoman kills him and claims command of the city. He names the Malazan Dunsparrow as his third, and he is named Falad. Then, Leoman rides into his city. Josh, uh, the chapter opens up. Map and Akarium are venturing into this sky keep, and we're underground. It's like this discovery. We see one of the flying machines and a short tail. And like our first impression of the Kachin Chamal was in Memories of Ice, of course. You know, we meet them, they're undead, there's blah, 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 blah. But this is like a deeper thing, and we're seeing these sky keeps close up, and we're venturing within them. How did seeing these sky keeps build on your impression of the Kachin Chamal, and what did you make of this kind of exploration scene? Uh, really, I, I did not expect to. So in some ways, I feel like Steve has changed the rules of his of his series dramatically when this chapter began, because like I fully believed, as did, I think, a lot of people in universe believe that the Kashin Shamal were extinct and like kind of just gone from the from the world at large. And we've really changed the game, which is kind of like learning that no, they've they're still here, their keeps are kind of maybe traveling the warrants. I don't know. I was very confused though, because like the characters who have so far found the Kachin Shamal, their response has been like, oh, they're dangerous. We gotta be careful. Like, I'll put like it's like it's like if AJ and I were walking through the woods and then there was a T-Rex, right? Like <laughs> AJ be, is mapping an aquarium, and, and their response is, whoa, a T-Rex, better watch out. And my response is, what the fuck is going on? That's not supposed to be here. And no one is reacting that way, and it's kind of confusing to me, if yeah. that makes sense. You know like, what I mean? you think people should be like, oh my god, an extinct race. Like, yeah, blah, an blah, extinct blah, blah, race blah. that is like, no. I mean, I get it, they're also dangerous, but like, it. I mean, I guess if you live in a world where you can just fucking talk to gods, I guess crazy shit is a bit less crazy but i don't know i th I found all the reactions to like all this stuff strange personally mm. so the exploration though was very very cool and man i was so disinterested in mapo and Icarium, and i still am a little bit but <laughs> i'm i'm at least now invested in seeing some sad boy time with the two of them because they are on the precipice of something and i don't know what it is and i feel bad for them but they are on a precipice. Yes. AJ, what did you make of this sequence? Uh, I thought it was neat. I don't know. I'm well, so I am concurrently reading Dead House Gates as well. Uh, and so I recently have just encountered a similar scene uh, where Akarium finds something old and it's like, did I do this? <laughs> or Matt was like, did he do this? And Akarium's like, hmm, I wonder who did this. So it's interesting that we're still in this same loop 
uh, which is something I know you guys have talked about being kind of frustrated with. It's like, oh, we're just back at the beginning now mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of how this arc is going. But uh, I thought it was cool. I, I I don't know. Seeing a keep like the 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 biggest look we've gotten into like Moonspawn is at the end of Memories of Ice, right? Like when they go inside to the crypt or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's a tad there, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and even that, yeah, right. Even that is just like, well, Moonspawn's dead and we're inside this thing. Um, but like, I mean, later, I guess, when they go in, we see a lot of, a lot more of like how these sky keeps kind of worked, which I thought was really interesting. But just the idea of of the Kachin Shamal as a race having these floating cities is really, really wild because like there are other races that are like human shaped, I guess. And I guess in my head, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I know how humans fly things. But for this like dinosaur race to be like, ah, yes, we've made flying cities like I can't even begin to think how they move them, <laughs> which I guess is just like big magic. I don't know, but it's cool. I like it. AJ, uh, play the Kachin Chamal theme music for me. What the fuck? <laughs> Change a mo, change a Thank you. Thank That'll you. be it. That'll be it. Uh, maybe I'll re-record it with with my voice so that it actually is. The change a mo, change a mo, the change a mo. I'll probably do we'll that. Work, we'll work it in. My point is this: I wanted to drop in, not drop in. If anything, take to the skies. Nice, because. We are it's seeing more of stupid. the Kachain Shamal. Probably my uh, default best, like, fucking drizzle it, all of this over my Sunday, baby. This is it. I'm in the gravity well. I'm in the sky keep. <laughs> my hands are swords. I'm in the combination like, gravity well and sky keep. <laughs> hey, are, are all of their hands swords? I've always been a little confused. No. No, you fool. That's what I, I think thought. <laughs> I was like, how they drive ship with sword? I didn't make any sense. Well, they got feet. <laughs> Fuck oh, you, they oh, got you feet. Fool. You, you sound so silly. I think explicitly the short tails don't have swords for hands. I think we That's learned that I thought in the in longest, House of Chains. And which ones are the more powerful spawn of the other? <sighs> I, isn't like one of them more like they're like one race, but kind of not like what is it again, Pete? I am not clarifying anything. <laughs> we know this, though. We've learned this yeah. in uh, yeah. the fourth book. I think the short tails are more powerful. I think the Kachin Shamal have swords for hands, but I think the short the tails short are like... short tails are different. Yes. And I do Thanks. think you're right. I The thing is this. I got to be honest. I have no clue what you guys know in regard yeah, to the Kachin Shamal. And enough. so in I'm the... just sticking my mouth in the upright position in the fourth book i don't think it was the fifth because we, <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about kachin shamal in house of chains i'm pretty sure we learned about the two types and that one of them was created by the other and that the one that was created became more powerful and kind of caused the rift that then led right. to their eventual like infighting and kind of the end of yeah them. that's that's the short tales they were kind of re-resurrected and then there was this like whole battle because like there's a kind yeah. of a different philosophical thing going on there and Just all of it and, and we could change them all and we've we've been it's been confirmed i think with kalama quick ben that they these ones are full of short tales right yeah it's always so interesting when to me like th i think the books are really talky in a weird way because like i i may not think about it sometimes but like we're gonna talk about cutter and Scalara and all them and like or Sam Ardev and Karsa most of those scenes pretty much is just people talking there's pretty much nothing but conversation mm -hmm. in those scenes do you mean yeah. so it's kind of funny to me when you take a sequence like this which is such like a spelunking sequence <laughs> um it kind of almost stands out to me as since it's essentially wordless and essentially the two of them are just within the belly of this thing with that said, uh, I think we can actually even we have a second chance to talk about Sky Keeps a little later on. Ooh. So let's turn our attention across the desert. India, you know, this whole crew's traveling together and Felis and Younger and Scalera are having this conversation with each other. What did you make of it? And what do you think Felis and Younger is looking for? I think Felis and pretty much I'd say that conversation was just kind of like a girl... <laughs> looking for some guidance, looking for mm. a mother figure. She seems just a little, I think that 
maybe she's realizing that she had to grow up a little too fast, um, living where she lived, not really knowing her mom, being sold off at a young age. And then Fellison um, kind of adopted her, old Fellison, but was never really a mother figure either because she was like 14 or however old she was, I don't know, 18, I don't know, regardless. So now Scalara is the next best thing. She's just hopping from mother to mother, it seems like at this point. She doesn't really, I think that she is just unsure of what a mother is supposed to be. So any female like figure around her, I think that she's just like, mom. Mm. How do you feel about Scalara as a would-be mother figure? Love her. Love her so much. I mean, I, I vibe in Scalara's head. Hmm. What? But like Scalara straight up says she's just going to give her baby away because that's what moms do in the seven cities. Like that's if that's the case. I don't know. That feels more like trauma speaking than like what all moms do. I don't know if she's saying that is like what she's going to do. I think that's just like, well, this she is the only. She explicitly, she explicitly said, can't says wait that's to her pop plan. this baby out and give it away is what she oh, said. I, thought, I, I think when I read it, it was more of a like, well, this is what how I've like grown up learning. This is how mothers take care of their babies. So like, how am yeah, I, I going to raise a kid? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, I see I what you're saying. I think that's, that's a very that's... responsible thought unless she sells her for money. That yeah, is what she said she's going to do, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the issue. Um. Like, the, I think I'm not prepared to deal with this, but I should find someone who is great. And then parentheses to make that money. Not money. great. Yeah. You know what? It is what it is out here. Times are hard. <laughs> Cuts you gotta do what you break. gotta do, you know? this. <laughs> Josh, Inge says she's vibing with Scalara. Whoa, whoa, what about you? No, but like... Hmm. I don't know. I, this whole crew is my least favorite part so far. What the fuck? What? Are you kidding? Yeah. No. You have lost your mind. You've absolutely <laughs> lost your mind. I'm sorry. I think it's like there's it's an interesting dynamic, but I just like don't know what the fuck they're doing besides trying to get to the jade hand. I don't know. Haboric has lost me a bit in general. Like I find it difficult to engage with an insane character and that is what currently what it feels like Haboric is. And so mm -hmm. whenever whenever he is in the scene, I'm instantly like, ah, that's I just don't love it. And he's in a lot of the scenes. I do like the temple scene with the the cool uh soldier that's incredible i love all of it but um and the exposition with the sagula but like the the like the day-to-day -day, like them going around and and just you know we're all we're in the desert it's not for me they're all just in the fucking desert yeah they're all in the desert I was, yeah but there's I was like actually... desert and then there's like desert you know, yeah, like Leoman's I, in the desert, bro, bro. You are insane. I <laughs> if these three chapters were literally just different scene pairings of it's like, well, now it's Cutter and Fellas and Younger and now it's Cutter and Gray Frog. And now we're going to do Haporic and Scalara. <laughs> we just spent time going back forth between different pairs. I would prefer that but to seeing any other scenes. I mean, my, but like my any problem, other scenes. Yes. My problem is I feel like in this group we have a demon who is essentially comedic relief and I guess occasionally well, sure, a I could, I could leave Grey Frog. I agree. Okay. And then we have a crazy man who just spouts off stuff that's only cool if you've already read the books because he's giving hints. And then you've got... And uh, a, a mom who is mad Josh. that she's a mom right now. And, and that's most of what she says when I read it. I, like, I don't really. And you, I don't. And oh, Felicity, my God. Fellas and Younger isn't a character yet. She has not said enough words to be a character. Oh, my God, Whoa. bro. <laughs> that is my opinion on this group. I don't love um, it. I take issue with the Fellas and Younger is not a character because. She's I, a character in the book. But like, to, what do you, what would you say are her are her defining traits? Well, I'm going to leave the podcast. <laughs> if, 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 if Josh, if we're just talking this specific book, I, I get, I guess, kind of not a lot. But her in context of the rest of her whole story of like where she came from and how she acted in House of Chains and like where, you know, what her whole vibe was there. I think this is a really interesting part of Fellas and Younger's story. Like on on I'm reading a quote now. Uh, she says I feel as if I'm going backwards. I felt older back in Reriku. Now with every day, I feel more and more like a child. And it's just like, that's so interesting to me because I, in the last episode, I think me, I think I said like, I didn't really know what she was doing. Cause it felt like she is like a kid now. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that to be the point, I guess um, I think is actually pretty interesting because I don't know if throughout any of these books, we've seen a kid deal with like what it's like to be a kid in this whole thing. 
You know what I mean? I would say we've had it at least a couple times. Last book, we had the dead one. I can't remember her name right this second. <laughs> but Kettle wasn't like she wasn't having the internal kid. struggle of like, what's it like yeah. to be a child? Because like, Kettle was I, like, I, I kind of get what you're saying, but like, I don't know. I feel like it, I feel like this book has uh, the book so far. I've had several children characters who have all just been like are all kind of off the deep end. And Felison's like the most normal of them. You know, Grub is just a, a, a I prophecy about spouting madman. I don't know. All it's right. just it's, we can move on. This well, is just but, not my cup of tea. It's not my favorite part of the book. Which I can Whatever, get mad man. at Josh again, but what, what is uh, obviously <laughs> we're on the same page about this plot line. These plot these plot lines. Yeah, I agree. I also think it's interesting that little Felicin is like copying Scalara as well. Like oh, with the Durhang, yeah. Like she had copied. I feel like older Felicin with her little when she was being like a little sassy in the last book. She was trying to like mm-hmm. emulate her, and now. <laughs> Now there's Scalara and she's like, well, let's, let's let's try this out. You know, just growing up. Yeah. And that's what I think is so interesting about it. I agree. And their conversation about Bidathal, very interesting, I find, you know, mm. and talking about them in the relationship to him, who kind of obviously hangs o- over a shadow as a shadow. You know, I think for me, the reason I ca- and then we, we should move on. But I think the reason here, let me, well, since we're since we're around, the next question I wrote down, we're staying in the pot. AJ, hmm. uh, Cutter speaks here about feeling like a leader and that like the group wants him to be to lead them. You know, why mm-hmm. do you think he feels that way? Well, I, I mean, Haborik straight up says to him. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Haborik is the one that says like, hey, you're a leader. <laughs> like He fully just sure. says that sentence. Um, so what do you but what it's are you clear, But it's clear that outside of Haborik saying that, that cutter feels the pressure on him already do you mm. mean yeah and i guess I, mean, I wonder where do you think that's coming from uh i think just by the nature of the situation like he is has taken this initiative and i think he kind of feels like he was like appointed in some way by uh like iscarol pust or like katalian or shadow throne or whoever um to like watch after this group and like accompany them so that's I, I think he's just kind of acting on that and is also kind of just like acting on his his impulses now, which are just like survive at all costs. Mm-hmm. Whereas Scalar and Felicens are kind of just like, I'm here hanging out. <laughs> um, and Haborix is like, I'm just a crazy person with no hands. And Gray Frog the is Jane people. Ah! Right. Uh, <laughs> and and Gray Frog's whole thing is just like, I'm I'm in love with Felicen Younger. So I think out of all of them, I, I, I don't think. Crocus really has a choice uh, and I think he sees that like if he didn't do it nobody else would I think India do you agree do you think the others like need a leader no what would they be do- I mean <sighs> he's I not know. even I, a good I, I, leader yeah I was to say he's not a good leader I have I have such a dissenting thought on this one too we don't need you doesn't mean we don't want you but we don't need you it, uh, yeah it's what like scolara says this chapter right don't think go around and think that we do need you i feel like what they need is they need to know who is going to be the one to make the decision in like the in the emergency scenario because if they don't because like if they don't like accept cutter now then like i feel like he's the most ready to give solutions in crunch time you know what i mean Mm-hmm. And like they need to be ready for that. Uh, and I also feel like Cutter has been needing to. I've wanted Cutter to be a leader like since the beginning, and this is his first chance at it. And he has a, such a shit crew to to try and work with in terms of like able to get out of a hairy situation. Yeah, well, I, I think we're I, about, I like Cutter as leader. We're about to. You find like out Cutter what? as leader? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have such a dissenting opinion on this. I'm so sorry. Listen. Crocus Younghan is my favorite character in the series, but he is not a le- good leader for this crew. And I, I would reject the idea that they need to be led. You know, I well, that's, reject yeah. that outright, you know, hmm. I guess. I don't know. I think I'm kind of I think I'm with Josh more or less. It's like in an emergency situation, someone's going to have to make a call. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. I guess if they were playing a game of touch football they was someone needs to make a call but that's what what are we talking about here bro well like this emergency situation that has just arrived at the end of of these sections the, this book rather of like something is coming we don't know what it is i don't know i i, I just feel like it's going to be a lot of hiboric doing weird magic stuff and then scalara cutter and felison trying to escape and I think uh, Cutter being the like seasoned warrior of that pack of the three of them, I think, is going to help. I don't know. Mm-hmm. 
So, Josh, you mentioned that this scene where the Segula ap- appears, the soldier of Ooh. Hyal's death, really, like, stood out to you. Like, obviously, I, I think it kind of stands out for an obvious reason. Um, what did you take away from the scene, and why did it grab you? What I got out of the scene is that the Segula are much like the Mandalorian sect that we see in The Mandalorian, where they have, like, retreated to the old ways. And I did not expect that, because, like... You know, everyone talks about the Segula as if this is what they've always done, but I find it so interesting that this this dude is like, nah, we used to be cool. I don't know why they don't fucking talk. Like, <laughs> chill out, guys. I love I love that he's just so casual about it. The guy's energy is fucking frantic. Yeah, I it's, wouldn't say casual is, is anywhere in the in my yeah, sentence describing like, this he's, man. He's very frantic in his up uh, and isn't he he's the one that's constantly like, I'm gonna fucking kill Hood. Isn't that what he's like screaming about was- a lot? Josh, you talked about it could change them all. People have an, a resounding chill with people with portals opening up out of yeah. nowhere. Someone speaking to them and then portals just dis- like sometimes just people appear yeah. and then they're gone. And everyone's pretty chill about it. You know, I really want to. I can't wait for like the one time in the book where we were just like Joe Schmo peasant and it happens and their whole <laughs> life is just fucking shaken <laughs> like. I don't know why I'm fucking firing, man. People just pop out portals and we got soldiers at death. I can't. I want that. I want that chapter so badly. <laughs> All right. And so Absalar's traveling and she comes to the fossil tower we've seen once before. And she talks with Urko Crust, this kind of old guard soldier about uh, Cotillion, the dancer, you know, the two different ones. And um, Urko thinks dancer is trustworthy. Do you think Absalar should trust Cotillion? That's a really, really good question. Um, I think, I don't know if this is a hot take, but I'm going to say, yeah. I think Cotillion feels like kind of (laughs) bad. And I think that he's going to do, I think it's going to be fine. I think Absalar is going to be fine if she just, you know. Just do what you got to do and he'll let you go. I think he likes her. Does anyone agree? Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I don't know if it's a, because I think I said this in the last episode too. It's not that he like likes her or it's like spending time with her or whatever. It's like a, Ooh, I'm sorry. I fucked your life up so hard. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I definitely think he feels remorse. Right. Yeah. But I think that remorse does, does yield some sort of, uh, like, I don't think he's trying to do her wrong in any way. Mm hmm. I mean, he's already done her wrong. He's already done her so wrong, so, right, exactly. So I think he's just kind of like, here, you you can do this, and then, you know, I'll let you go, and you'll be good. And, yeah, I don't have any reason to believe that he won't let her free. He's already done her so wrong, so yeah. now he just needs her to run a few more errands. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's the way I see it. Listen, I never... He's not perfect, but he's no monster. Uh, well... You could argue what he did was a little... Yeah, it's kind of monstrous. <laughs> Listen, it's fine. I, I think he he's was trustworthy. A- I thought it was really funny, too, mm-hmm. in that scene with those little um, ghost oh things. Oh, my fucking God. That part is so good. When they take over the little Kachinchamal little skeleton <laughs> yeah. things. Fuck. That was oh, so my God. funny. And, and, they, and they start walking around, and Urko's like, oh, that's how they stand to keep their balance. They have to lean forward. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> Oh, man. And then the later mm-hmm. chapters where they're just like, oh, the t- skeletal feet <laughs> to, like jump up beside her. It's just so fucking good. I, it's yeah, really, I'm really obsessed. Good. I was I think that that I just oh, God, it's so funny. It was yeah. very funny. I love those two characters. I have nothing else to add. Josh, what's Tarlag Veed up to? What's his deal? <laughs> Who's uh, I didn't know in this chapter. First off, I until chapter six, maybe chapter five, I don't know which was still getting the like. I was very confused because uh, Dejim Nabal is also called something. He's a, tr- a trollagost or something. Yeah, or some fucking weird name. Gabara or something. Yeah, and they kept using them side by side, and I was like, is this one or two people? So it took me fucking forever to figure that one out. But um, well, Josh, he's actually I, seven dogs. I, he's whatever. <laughs> uh, I mean, at this point, I didn't know, but I mean, obviously, now we know what he's doing. He's watching to make sure that the nameless ones, the, the, the this things, my, the nameless ones, actually kills Akari and Mapo Run. So. Also, I do have a prediction about that. Well, we'll get to it next chapter. We'll uh, get to it next chapter. Josh, leaving us on a cliffhanger here. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, to return to uh, my favorite group, put a little pin on it. AJ, Scolaris speaks with Cutter here about what he, what Cutter's doing there. 
and why Cutter's protecting them about the gods. What is Scalara doing there? And why, like, I don't know. What do you think she's looking for out of traveling with them? I mean, I, I mean, we, we don't know what Scalara's life was like before House of Chains, but she kind of talks about it with Felsen, where it's like, you know, she was just in this fog of, you know, Durhang and stuff and with with Bidithal and all that. And, you know, I don't know or like we as the audience, I guess, don't know where she would go back to. And I think for her to be here and to like accept Taboric's, you know, blessing or whatever, um, and to decide to to go on with him, um, I think just kind of speaks to like she doesn't have much else besides herself. And I think she knows she has a better chance of surviving with at least with Haboric, but also just like with a group of people as opposed to just like going back to wherever she came from, because like where the whirlwind like was like Shaikh's camp and stuff is, you know, destroyed or whatever now. And to get back to any other semblance of civilization, you have to like cross the desert. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think her choice was like cross the desert alone to maybe get back to somewhere, wherever you, wherever she came from or cross the desert with, you know, these four people. So I think her choice is to like do it in a group and do it with the guy who has magic hands because, Hey, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> also, she, Gray Frog definitely isn't talking to her because she's pregnant, right? Like, it's got to be some weird shit where Gray Frog's talking with the baby or something. I, I'm constant. That's like the one thing that I, I really has gripped me is why Gray Frog won't talk with her. Anyone have any thoughts? Uh, I mean, I guess that's part. That could be part of it. I really don't know. I haven't thought too hard about it. Okay. <clears throat> well, when Gray Frog does that weird thing with Cutter later, mm-hmm. where he's just like spitting weird facts, <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> That part's so good. I have, I just feel like, why? why? I, here's my question. He was doing that weird facts thing, but it wasn't like he was just like being funny and chatting. And I was just like, what's going on here? I was very confused. But I don't know why he doesn't communicate with Scalara. And I just feel like it has something to do with her specifically, but I just don't know mm-hmm. what. I got to yeah. be the pregnancy. That's what I'm saying. He's got, maybe he's afraid of babies. Maybe he's afraid of babies. That could be a fun fact. I know I am. You got a baby? Not talking to you. Um, too, I do, too, too fragile. I, I, I do just want to say we left a couple of, of big bits in the past uh, after the uh, the night the soldier of High House Death shows up. One, he leaves his spear when he leaves, which is just like there on the ground. They're like, oh, we'll just take a spear, I guess. Uh, and also he brings up that like uh, Baruch and Mamet are like yeah, these ancient that was so crazy. beings or whatever. Um, or at least that's how Cutter interprets it. Um, it's how kinda, I interpreted it. Yeah. So that was just kind of wild. I just didn't want to leave that in the dust. There was lots of Darugistan talk there. I miss yeah. Darugistan. <laughs> Cutter does, too. I think for me, the reason this section and Josh, I just am stunned by what you said. I feel blindsided. Not only do I love the conversations between these characters, but mostly I feel much more invested in these characters than almost any of the others in the book. Do you mean Mm. Absol are probably amongst them, you know, Mm -hmm. but easily more than anyone in the 14th army i care about these characters above them so I that's agree. that's how str- that's yeah. how strongly i feel joshua so i was quite struck well, when I'm, you i'm sorry well josh you had a different <laughs> opinion than me so how, how imagine the nerve <laughs> you know you know there is no such thing as a right opinion well in this case <laughs> in <Okay>. this case <laughs> Before we roll into the next chapter, we just want to quick stop and thanks everyone who's backing us on Patreon. Just appreciate it so much. It helps keep the show going. Josh, why don't you thank these lovely people? Yes. Maybe. Give me one sec. As soon as AJ gets it up. Hey. Yes. Gets it up. When did we record last? The 14th? <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> AJ, keep that in the show. <laughs> Thanks to these incredible human beings, we've officially got over 200 patrons on the Patreon, which is silly. Uh, (laughs) So thank you to Sam, Matt, Ben, the Elder God Draconis, Mickey, and Ian. Yeah, I, really thought, I thought I read the Elder God Draconis last time. Like, I have a vivid memory of that. Yeah, I think somebody else's name is also the Elder God Draconis. Um, but we did get a very nice message from 
this, the Elder God Draconis, uh, specifically saying like, and I make 200 and then like being very nice about the show, <laughs> which is cool. Like I, it's, yeah. it's a wild milestone. Thank you very much for the message. Uh, and thank you very much to anybody who sent us messages about, you know, they're enjoying the show or just any of your thoughts. Honestly, um, you can always send us a message on Patreon. Patreon. Uh, it's usually me checking them, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll shoot stuff to pete if it is what i yeah. i run the i run the twitter are yeah. we just talking no i'm just i was just saying like if you send a message it usually goes to me but i <laughs> and if um, anyone has some scrapple hot takes i'm always here for your scrapple hot <laughs> takes and the discord right. was going wild about it yeah thank you so much for backing the show uh do d- yeah thanks thanks it really means a whole a bunch so chapter five okay Wait. in i got another sale on etsy hell yeah oh we're at three sales that were not from my friends. <laughs> You're all moving on up in the world. Chapter 5 Invention is discussed between Samar Dev and Karsa. Samar Dev investigates the keep and the corpse of the short tail that had seemed to kill all the Malazans. Samar dissects the beasts, finding mechanisms within. After she tells Karsa of an island called Sepik, split into two populations. They agree to travel there together. Samar sees spirits being drawn at Karsa. Quick Ben speaks about what happened on Genabacus, the ghost of Raraku, and the Perrins. The burned tears interrupt them and bring them to the adjunct. Tavor asks what they found in the Imperial Warren. 10 to 12 Kachin Jamal Sky Keeps travel through the Warren. Quick Ben thinks the Imperial Warren could be the old Kachin Jamal Warren. Tavor orders them to infiltrate and find out what's going on. Quick Ben and Kalam reluctantly agree. The Scorpion, Joyful Union, is killed by the new captain, Ferret and Sort. Bottle disrespectfully salutes her in response and tells the captain his name is Smiles. Captain Ferret and Sort speaks with Fiddler. She dispenses orders to them, including Smiles, to have a double load. Fist Kenem speaks with Grub and then leaves. The Fist worries about Tavor, missing Quick Ben, and growing dread amongst the soldiers. Helian wakes up, now on her eighth day, at her new post in the 14th. Bottle speaks with Maybe and Lutz about Joyful Union's death. Then Bottle speaks with his squad about Ferret and Sort. Korok suspects she's hiding her background and that she actually comes from a powerful post on Stormwall. They're going to hold off on killing her. Quick Ben plans to infiltrate one of the Sky Keeps with only Quick, Kalam, and Stormy. Dejim Nebral has neared its prey and now lies in wait. He foresees a new empire that he will lead. Absalar speaks with Tellerist and Kirtle about time and the great forest that once covered this land. Absalar calls upon her warren and enters these shadowy forests, seeing destruction from where dragons once fought. She sees a ship sailing. She wades into the forest and finds an anchor and rope covered in shadow. She climbs up the rope up aboard a ship, where she finds Ganos Perrin. They start to talk about gods and knowing your enemies. They will catch up more as the boat sails together, now on ocean water. Samar and Karsa leave together, continuing their conversation when Karsa speaks of an army waiting at home for him. As they near cliffs, Haborg declares that there is a war to bury all the elder gods. Skalara thinks Haborik has gone mad and admits to Cutter she is pregnant. India, Samar Dev continues to travel along Karsa throughout this chapter, first to the Skeep, and then later they keep talking again. Compared to his old traveling companion in Leoman, what do you make of this change in dynamic with Samar Dev? And what do you make of her now that we're seeing more of her? I think that um, I like the the difference in relationship. I think that she's a little bit more challenging and um, opinionated. I think, I don't know. I just think that they're not as like, 
they don't really, they're not palling around, you know, they, like they are, but I just feel like it's more like, this is a weird thing. Instead of like a friend thing, it gives me more of like sibling, sibling vibes, sibling rivalry mm. vibes, mm. Mm. Um, which I think is interesting. I, I enjoy it. I think it's very funny actually, because I like the, the, the kind of bickering between them. And I also, I don't know, Samar Dev is a little bit more like, they're different in that I feel Sam Dev is more, um, I guess, looking for, like, more interested in the information of things hmm. and trying to figure things out, which I think is different from Carsa, who's just kind of like, yeah, let's go. We're going to go now. And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to we're not going to talk about we're going to be about it. But um, Sam Dev is more like, well, let's like look through this and like, let's kind of dissect this and see what it is and then figure things out about it. So I kind of like that dynamic. Um, it adds a little bit more texture and layers to the story. Um, AJ, what do you make of the contrast of these people? Andy, I think you're d- nailed it 100 percent. I think I, I think oh, I agree with what you said. I love Sam Dev. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, getting these scenes from Sam Dev's POV is really good at kind of I don't know it, it it has me thinking about Carsa has me thinking about Carsa period it's not just like oh I'm with Carsa I know Carsa's deal like seeing him through Sam Dev's eyes and like some of the stuff that he does that she notices I don't have a specific example please don't ask me is just is just pretty is pretty interesting and I think the Carsa's interaction with her is cool too because we haven't really seen Carsa not be like duty bound or something like right now he's just kind of chilling like he doesn't have this like big goal of like you know bringing up forth the apocalypse or like figuring out his past <laughs> and and getting the 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 big cool sword or anything or finding the giant horse like he has done all of that stuff and now he's kind of in like he's in the the hub town between quests you know what i mean <laughs> and so he's just kind of like chilling and and meeting this new character uh you know, meeting Samar Dev. So I think it's it's pretty cash. It's pretty cool. Uh, and I like it. Josh has just picked up a kitty cat and brought the cat to the recording. She was meowing at the door very loud. I did hear her meow. Yeah, <laughs> she's in my lap now. She's happy. I have a house plant. Ooh. I have to be honest. Mm-hmm. Karsha is a character that really gets under my skin and these scenes really were bothering me. Why? And I love Sam Dev. She's like the thing that makes these scenes tolerable. But I really a, a little bit of Carsa goes a long way. <laughs> and these chapters, he just keeps being there and he keeps saying stuff. And I just it really I just can't handle it. I can't handle it. So, hmm. whew. but yeah. <laughs> That's that's where I'm at, and I'm clearly holding in. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm holding within this rant, you know. Why not? Why not let it out? I just think I just personally feel like so much of what Carsa says is so stupid. <laughs> I and yes, yes, I, I find it to be so incredibly dumb. And then often someone will be like, "Man, what an interesting point, Carsa." And I just could not disagree more. You know, and I just cannot get over it. And I cannot get over his point of view that like, hey, we should just kill everyone. You know, civilization, bad, bad, bad take. Let's end it. You know, Uh, it is it is just I just cannot get over this. You know, I think it's better if you find the humor in how ridiculous what he says is, because I think that these scenes are hysterical of just like. Sam Dev, incredibly smart inventor, you know, ca- grappling with these existential questions um, of, you know, everything. And then Cars is just like, I'm going there because it's what I will do. And no questions. Very. Con- and I just it's such a fun uh, juxtaposition of the two. And I, I'm, I'm with you, P. I think I every most of what Cars says, I'm like, that's fucking dumb. But, you know, confidence gets you get you 80 percent of the way there. <laughs> so. Josh, I get what you're saying that I like there's an element of him that I do like. I don't think the book is like agreeing with everything he says. You know, I don't think that's like, the I, I you know, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But I just feel like sometimes the book tacitly endorses him and his point of view by making him just 
so often like oh he just said he was going to do the thing and he did the thing it's yeah, like yeah i know what you mean i know what you don't, mean don't you just need to be really confident and ha- like you know i don't know it just anyway i just i just could really go on and on about it but it just it grinds your obviously gears. just we all have characters we like <laughs> this mm-hmm. is not my favorite character it is it is known i've articulated it before on the show i was just feeling salty today mm-hmm. that's fair buddy <sighs> so AJ, AJ, ask a question. I can't. <laughs> no, I've got, I've got it. Okay. I really want to talk about the beauty of simplicity. Some, like sometimes Steve be doing a lot. Yeah. You know, he does the most a lot of the time. But mm-hmm. I really love when he, when he decides, no, 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 I'm gonna make you have the strongest feelings in under two sentences, and that is exactly what happens. When this fucking captain comes in and squashes Joyful Union. (laughs) But I like, I felt, I felt Bottle just die Uh. inside. And like, we know that Bottle has some shit inside of him that you probably, you know, if it bubbles over, like he could probably do a lot of damage. And I just loved the thought of like, man, imagine this captain comes up and is just like, all right, time to swing to, you know, really get my... You know, let him know I'm here. And me squash the score. And I would love if Bottle had just been like, ah, and melted her. <laughs> it would have made my life. But I just thought it was such a good. And it's like, I just love that it's a scorpion. And it's just, it reverberates. Like, the next scene is these other guys. They're like, we've got this new scorpion. And Bottle's like, it's over. <laughs> They've killed Joyful Union. <laughs> oh, it's all worthless now. It's so funny. Yeah, Every there, bit of it is incredible. There's, there's a lot of these scenes with the 14th that really just gets me so just like I want to stop reading it because it's too much. But the recurring scorpion bit that happens throughout is really, really good because every time it comes up, it's like, oh, we have to kill the new captain now. So (laughs) (laughs) they're like (laughs) they're actively plotting to murder her over this scorpion. So funny. And honestly, I I could see them murdering her, which really kind of sucks, honestly. (laughs) Like, yeah, uh, I don't know, because honestly, she feels like a good direction for the 14th. They need some discipline, you know, we're going to see. We haven't actually got to see this meeting yet. It's been set up, but we haven't. I mean, we we know it's going to be said, but it hasn't actually happened. I'm excited, though. Yeah. I'm excited to know that there's there's a wall in this, just like, I mean, a very, very different from Game of Thrones, but there's a wall here, too, with, like, stoic defenders. I'm pretty hype. <laughs> I think all media needs a wall. Full Metal Alchemist has a big wall in the snow, and those characters are some of the best characters, and they're there for only a moment. Pete, any wall thoughts? I literally I literally just read Stone Wielder, a book about this wall. <laughs> really? Um, I didn't know that. That's cool. I thought I assumed Stone Wielder was a Carsa thing because he has a big flint sword. I no. just I, I said it was stupid, which I, well, you know, I do. I, I regret saying, but are we back on Carsa? Yeah. What are we on, dude? I just I got to move on. I can't do it. I just like well, we had moved on. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I was trying to put a pin in it. I just. Yeah. Big feelings. We, Let him we out. put a pin in it. By, I by, just think it's a juxtaposition between I find him so unbearable <laughs> uh-huh. and th- his <laughs> confidence and the tone of him is like, I'm actually the greatest person ever. Sure. And I feel so strongly the opposite of this, you know? Sure. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it only further gets on my nerves. It only further gets on my nerves. But Pete, you know? isn't that the purpose? Don't you think Steve wrote him this way to elicit this exact response? I, I do think there I do th- I don't think you're entirely wrong about that. I don't think the book is like saying Carsa is the greatest person ever or anything. You know, mm-hmm. I think the book indicts Carsa in many ways. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think it presents him as a complicated character. However, anyway, we got to keep moving on because I got so many <laughs> thoughts about this character and this is not what the episode's about. Yeah. I'm sorry I got so distracted in my my emotions. Sometimes we get distracted in our emotions. <laughs> I've never Did we talk about Farad and Sort? What's your impression of her? We don't we did. Don't yeah, we, we did. We, we, were we did. Passive, yeah, she she crested the scorpions. Next, so uh, next question. We we speaking of of uh the the meeting that's inevitable. We get a meeting between Tavor and Quick Ben Kalam and Gessler. Where she just basically tells them, like, hey, fuck off to the Warrens and figure out what's going on with these moon spawns. I mean, pretty rightfully so. They're like, oh, hey, yeah. we saw boop, 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 hey, we saw a bunch of sky keeps. And she's like, well, tell me more. <laughs> you should go back in. All right, I guess so. 
Yeah, that scene that that was uh, a lot. Hey, yeah, what people, is a sky keep? That's what Moonspawn was. I like how they call them Moonspawns. They, that's very funny to me that they keep calling them Moonspawns. So Moonspawn, Moonspawn, Moonspawn and the... sky keep can be used interchangeably, except Con- Moonspawn, yeah. Moonspawn is a place. Moonspawn is a proper noun, but a sky keep is a type of. It's like, it's like like it's like calling a tissue a Kleenex. Yeah, yeah. got or, it. Or or a, a a bandage adhesive, a band or a Q tip, a Q tip. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, a cotton swab. A cotton a bandage swab. or band aid. Um, Pete, you said a lot of information was presented in that scene, and I don't know what you're what you're talking about. Which one? In the scene I where just, bef- before tells we him moved to on, I gotta be honest, I completely zoned out. I assumed you talked about everything in the fourteenth. Uh, we, didn't, all the boxes. we didn't talk much about the what you were just leading us into the um the, the quick Ben and Tavor meetings. We didn't really get on that. Yeah. The ap- shout out Hellion return. Uh, Hellion's yeah. here back from the That's prologue. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of inevitable she is going to show up, but still, mm-hmm. I don't think that's tr- true that it's inevitable. But well, I I read the books before I so <laughs> okay <laughs> okay because I could very much see I could very much see that just being a thing that was left in the prologue. Um, yeah, this fucking worm of autumn or whatever is popping yeah. up all, is all over the place, which is annoying because we like haven't heard of them at all before, and then suddenly it's like the most important fucking cult or sect or whatever. Drek, Drek, Drek. Nope, Drek, Drek. I don't, I don't know how you hit the D, but Drek, ah. Drek. Anyway, um, so Absalar is in the Shadow Realm. She's wading through these forests. She climbs aboard this boat. What's that? Ba-boom. Gano's parent returns to the story. AJ, how'd you feel? Uh, it was great. Uh, it was awesome. I didn't realize that, like, Quick Ben thought that he had died. That kind of threw me off. Uh, no, I think Quick Ben was, like, lying to them in that scene. Okay, it was it was a ruse. Okay. Yeah, I really yeah, Quick wasn't, Ben knows I wasn't he's sure. not dead. Okay, 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 good. No, it was great. Uh, I love Perrin. I now have a, a, a deeper love for Perrin after... Uh, having read gardens of the moon now this gr- great great boy great character he does say i actually don't know if it's here or if it was in the next scene we get with them that it's been seven months he he, he said he, he was living with raced for seven months and now he's on this boat that felt like a long time like seven months feels like it's been a while it, i mean they've had like the whole march across the desert i mean i think at the start of this book they say it's been like four months since the end of house of chains yeah a lot oh, has happened can yeah we, a lot can, has happened I, can i just say Gan Perrin is really giving off I did study abroad in Europe vibes to me. <laughs> huge, <laughs> huge vibes. Like he's over here like cheers whenever he leaves something like that's <laughs> Oh that he has gotten up from the computer. <laughs> the single funniest thing you've ever said on the show. That is like literally, there is nothing better. That is the truest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Absolutely. He's he's like, oh, in, in my times in Barcelona. <laughs> yes. He is hugely giving off that energy. <laughs> oh my God. Um, Fucking fantastic. Yeah, it is good. I'm I'm glad parents back, and I'm loving the the educated vibes he's bringing. He really yeah. is though. He is a different character. Like no more tummy mm-hmm. aches, no more headaches. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was like being he's, like ripped alive by yeah, like oh, overwhelming by power. His dog. Oh my feelings. Can't, like literally can't stop. Like it's just <laughs> night and day. A lot can happen in seven months. True. <laughs> I have a distinct memory of when I read this book for the first time. She like climbs aboard this ship and finds Parent. I like practically pump my fist. You know, it's been like oh, yeah. three books since you've seen the kid. Right. And it's like, damn, fucking the kid. He's like, I don't know, the start of the book. And like when I picked up Gardens of the Moon, I was like, he's the main character. Oh, yeah. I was mistaken. But <laughs> You know, it's I don't know. It's it's in a big emergence back onto the scene. Josh, yeah, did. what did you make of the conversation they had on the boat? I loved it. I loved the I, guys. There was some sexual tension, right? It's not just me, please. I always thought oh, I really, like, there was yeah. such a like spark between them. And I was like, what the fuck? It was very weird to me because I like Absalar clearly likes Crocus still Cutter, whatever. She doesn't uh, like Cutter. She feels bad for him. No, she was crying in the she first fully, chapter yeah. about how much she missed him and wanted to be with him. She doesn't. It's Perrin. I always knew it was. <laughs> I forgot that was your book one for a pick was those two. 
Mm. Incredible. Um, I I love the conversation. I thought it was it was like well I don't know. She did kill him. I always forget that. You know, she did do a murder. She's a heartbreaker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I thought it was, it's such an interesting conversation. Like, like, but when you, like, step back and think about this conversation in terms of, like, what the characters have been through and, like, their weird relationship with each other, mm-hmm. yeah, I was honestly shocked by how, like, familiar it felt. Like, their, their tone with each other. Because it's like, they really don't know each other. She murdered him, and then he came back from the dead, and then they've almost had no interaction since. Right. Yeah. He he hasn't known her as not possessed. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one of those weird scenes where we, the audience, have such a different relationship than the characters in the book, Mm -hmm. because obviously we like these are two of the main leads of the series and we like have a lot of affection and we know so much about them. But they have a different relationship to each other and they know what they don't know a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And there's all this stuff. So like it's once again, it's it's like, I think, kind of why they spend t- time off screen catching up. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting that there's that distance between the reader and the characters. Um, AJ, it looks like you're trying to. Yeah, I just I think it's interesting having Perrin like fully be master of the deck now. Um, Mm -hmm. because I, you know, you're talking about the disconnect between, or we're talking about the disconnect between like, he only knew her as sorry when she killed him. Uh, and then short a little bit afterwards, but like also now he just kind of knows everything, uh, is my impression. He knows his enemies. It's like, he has read, he's read the 10 books, you know, he like, he knows, (laughs) he knows all the, the, the stuff that's in play. He knows what everyone's been up to. And I think on her end, on Absalar's end, like, she has all of Cotillion's memories and stuff and, on you know, some access to that Cotillion knowledge. So I think, honestly, they know each other better than, like, uh, they normally would, you know? India, what do you think this means? And are you ex- for Perrin to enter the story? And are you excited that Ganos is in the book now? I am excited. Um, so I... I think it's going to add an, a, a level of uh, more things that I don't understand, <laughs> i.e. deck of dragons or whatever. So um, master of the deck, whatever he is. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that has to obviously come into play at some point, which I'm not super excited about because, again, I don't. It's just like another thing. It's like, what the fuck? So I'm sure he's going to. I don't know. I do think that he will have hopefully a really big part in this book because I did miss the character um except for like I miss the character that we met I didn't necessarily love him when he was going through that that time oh, when he was having that time when he was he was just <laughs> not not a good time oh he was he was oh man listen to you I know I was just <laughs> not about it it was just annoying just like shut up <laughs> Uh, um Christ it's just how I felt um I I just I I don't like the lamenting such a such an overdone thing you know (laughs) we get it you're sad we're all sad anyway (laughs) i digress so i'm intrigued i'm excited to see what he does i have have no fucking concept no idea this is a whole new parent like literally a whole new Mm -hmm. character so i have no i don't know what to expect i i'm i'm intrigued to see if there's like a though um if him and absol are do kind of stay together if you know what i mean what do you mean just travel together i suppose do some shit <laughs> um I, I i don't think they're gonna end up together because they're both from such like no way, high yeah. perspectives like they're they're outside of the like they're evolved they'd be they'd be too powerful <laughs> as a power couple <laughs> <laughs> truly um yeah. you can't have two alphas so <laughs> um i but do you think that Perrin really didn't fuck with uh absolar's what is cotillion yeah. Right? I mean, Cotillion killed him. Right. Yeah, technically it was Cotillion in Sari's body. So I do question what might happen in the grander scheme, you mm. know, in that way. Mm. Is there beef? Are they beefing Cotillion and Perrin? No, I don't think so. Why not? Yeah. I, I why, because... did, why did Cotillion kill Perrin? Never thought about that. I guess maybe because it was Adjunct Lorne's, like, aid? Yeah, he was he he was that's exactly what it was. Yeah, okay. it was, so he was he just was, he was the link to damage. the empire and, and all that. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it wasn't because he was par- it was because of his role, not because of who he was. If you think about it, that one act set off Perrin becoming the fucking master of the deck. Pretty much. It's almost as if it was all foretold. Ooh. 
<laughs> Speaking of which, it's been uh, it's like a two year anniversary of our show nowadays. Oh my goodness. I guess, speaking of which, what do you mean? <laughs> well, all I was going to say is that it seems like it's been forever since we read those scenes in Gardens of the Moon. Mm. And I was like, well, it's been like two years. That's how long the show's been. God, yeah, so. I mean, it's, a pretty, it's, it's a pretty good button. Yeah. Well, it'd show's be a good, bu- it. good button if we didn't have a chapter <laughs> six to discuss. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, shimmy on Shake Down the Way and kick it oh, into... Okay. Before we go, can I say one thing? Because we, we, we did glaze a lot of the 14th stuff. Can I make one comment? Please. Uh, uh, okay. I was honestly so stressed. I was so yeah. Go. I talked a lot of in the last book and with Steve actually about like how much I like the idea of like you have to be prepared for the enemy to ha- to enemy's magic, so you bring your magic to counteract it. And we are seeing such an example of it because fucking Leoman's army is all is so like we've got to watch out for Quick Ben and Quick Ben's just gone, and that's. <laughs> The funniest shit to me that they are doing. And also, their army's like, we don't have a high mage. They're going to have a high mage. And I am 99% certain Leoman does not have a mage. And so they're both going to be, like, prepared for magic genocide. And then it's just going to be human beings. And I love it. it. I love this dance they are always doing. That's my speech. Thank you. Chapter 6. Korab watches Leoman take over the city of Yucatan. Korab is skeptical and worried about Dunsparrow. We learn of the city's history, the old goddess of olives, and eventually Leoman reveals his plan to speak directly to the Queen of Dreams. Matt Bonacarium speak together about dragons and the war on gods. They talk about who could have killed this dragon, Sorit, and Akarium suspects it was the Eater. Ikarium starts to think he is cursed and that Mappo is protecting the world from him. They set off to the Jago Dan to find a Jaga. Kenna rides past the barrows of Yucatan, reflecting on the city's dark history with Malzan forces. The city itself has been evacuated, and unfinished trenches surround Yucatan. He thinks the omen wants to martyr himself. Bottle delivers a message to all the sergeants. Captain Farad and Sort wants to meet with them. He returns to his squad, and Gessler and the others have come back from the Imperial Warren. They speak about the plan to see Jigatan, and Bottle thinks more on his family. Later, he feels lost, and on a hilltop, the Arasal finds him. The ancient woman seems to be following the army through the echoes of time and indicates her pregnancy. Bottle sees the father is a tist eater, and the child may be a future ruler of a healed realm of shadow. Bottle thinks the Irasol demands him to be her god, and he agrees. Ajak Tavor meets with her fists, Kenneb, Blistig, and Tene Baralta. After discussing Timul's suggestions and strategy, Blistig and Baralta are dismissed. Tavor tells Kenneb that Dujak's host has been broken, and the High Fist himself is a shadow of what he once was. Kenneb leaves upset and goes to find Fiddler, who when asked confirms all that the adjunct has told him. Perrin lands in Kansu. Absalar and he talk about the bridge burners, Krull, and if the Elder Gods oppose the crippled god. The city is quiet, and Perrin explains a plague has come to seven cities, and that the healers at the Temple of Drek have been killed. Finally, they separate and go their own ways. Samar and Karsa speak of progress together, debating civilization and savagery. Kalam speaks on the Skykeep. Quick Ben's magic power has been sapped. Kalam calls Cotillion to them, who helps them to a fissure where Quick Ben and Stormy are. Stormy is unconscious, but healed by Cotillion. Cotillion reveals they are in a temple to an elder god. He looks knowingly at Quick Ben, then Cotillion leaves. Greyfrog tells Cutter something bad is coming, and they begin to move. On the edge of a cliff, Mapo and Akarium are ambushed. 
Dejim Nebral attacks, and Mapo plummets off the cliff. AJ, we haven't touched on it thus far. Mm -hmm. Um, Yigatan and Korat. Yes. So Kor and earlier in chapter four, we saw them come to Yigatan. The the Falad was killed and Leoman took control of the city. Dunsparrow was named as the third. And in this chapter, we see Leoman really take control of the city. We read about these killings and we learn much more about the history of the city. The history of these temples, of the of the battle that once happened and the echoes there yeah and then eventually we learn more about leoman's plan to speak to the queen of dreams at the end of chapter four korab has misgivings he thinks you mm-hmm. know and clearly that only grows as he sees this preparation for the siege and he thinks on dun sparrow and wonders what leoman's doing mm-hmm. um what do you think about these misgivings and are you feeling the same feelings i love these misgivings <laughs> i think and i i think he has a right to be confused mm-hmm. you, you know skeptical but also it comes off like he is so jealous like he has a crush he on the omen so jealous. he has a crush so on the omen and dunsparrow is coming in between that and she is not welcome and <laughs> it's really really good that i was like cracking up that entire section uh honestly just korab is is quickly climbing the scales of being one of my favorite characters um between the last episode we were talking about him eating the fish row and stuff and this episode where he's talking talking about it being so hot that the hallucinations of grandma's wanting to pinch his cheeks um it's so it's so yeah it's i could eat it all day i could eat it for breakfast lunch and dinner and i think he has earned some of these misgivings i think i mean he's seen so much go wrong following leoman uh and somehow doesn't see that leoman is the common denominator (laughs) he's not just like no i you know it's the other people leoman's right but um you know that's that's blind loyalty i guess but I think it's really good. I think it's really interesting. And I think the the Yigatan stuff uh, of all the temples being destroyed, except the Queen of Dreams one, how it, you know, the, the all the Malzan blood that has been shed. Um, I think that's really interesting thinking about it now uh, in one of these chapters. Quick, somebody says something about uh, like blood magic or something. And Quick Ben says, ah, the best kind, uh, which makes me think something real fucked up is going to happen uh, because Yigatan has all of this blood in the sand. But we'll see about that, I guess. India, do you have misgivings about Leom? And, and uh, what did you think of the scene where he kind of kills the Falad and takes control of this city? And, you know, he's the big he's the Falad now. Uh, Leoman is having a life crisis, I think. He is confused. He doesn't even know his place. He's out here just saying, well, it is me. But like, you're a liar. I don't believe it is. <laughs> And the fact that he just randomly killed that pert, did anyone see that coming when it happened? Or oh, am no. I just, I was like, what the frick? What is yeah. going on here? You can't just do that. This person was laughing and then you just, what? Anyway, pissed off. He not shouldn't have made it. fun of Liam and the, of the flails, I guess. Clearly. <laughs> And now you know. If you don't know, now you know. I think it's pretty reasonable, right? Like, the, the, the army of the apocalypse has fallen apart, and they're like, okay, you take the Book of Dryshna, and you get out of here with, like, a couple hundred guys. You're in charge now. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, he's out here feeling like, well, what do you mean, bro? You know, like... For a second, I thought you were saying the decapitation was reasonable, and I was like, that's a horrible thing. Of all the takes we've had on this show, I think that might be the wildest one. <laughs> That is not true, but <laughs> I just mean in general, I think Leoman is, I agree, I think but Leoman yeah. is feeling, you know, having a bit of a crisis. Mm-hmm. Josh, um, uh, we didn't really talk about it, but within the Change Kamal Skykeep, um, they come across this dragon that's crucified, um, and we're meeting, we've met a few more dragons in this book, and this is not the first crucified one we've seen in the series. Do you like learning more about them? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why? I, it's okay. I guess my issue is I feel like the dragons are so mm, like disconnected from it. To me, they feel disconnected from the the actual like on the ground story we have that they are like a little bit too heady for me. You know, mm. I'm sure like on a reread, the dragons have lots of cool things about them that I would get. But right now it, it it's they're just pieces to a puzzle 
and the and Steve still hasn't handed me the box to show me what the puzzle looks like. Mm. And so that that's kind of how I feel about them most of the time. They're cool. Yeah. The, I mean, dragons are sick, man. You know, uh, there's a reason they're in all fantasy. But I, until I know more, they kind of are just sort of I'm, I'm sort of like, I'll care about you when I understand you. Something I learned about myself in Guardians of the Moon when Anna Amanda Rake turns into a dragon in the finale of that book is I just love dragons. And when one shows up in a book, the book gets better. That's just if that's a mathematic fact, you know, M- more dragons, better book. You know, that's just science, mm-hmm. baby. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I love seeing this dragon and, uh, you know, it's metal. <laughs> I think it's interesting that the uh, we've seen two. Well, one crucified and one just like on a pike. Right. This one was just kind of on a spike. And the POVs that we see these dead dragons from are like Troll and Unrak, who are like two ancient people or whatever. And then also Mapu and Akarium, who are even more ancient. So it's so both times it's just kind of like, hmm dead dragon yes and like that's all we get mm-hmm. out of it mm-hmm. it's, it's it's just yeah. like okay yeah. well okay <laughs> yeah i mean i get what you're saying but i do think to almost loop back to what josh was saying at the beginning of the episode it's kind of a writing jam i mean like did you really want to read the people be like whoa this is crazy oh, yeah yeah like yeah for sure i'm just i'm yeah. just saying it was interesting i don't know <laughs> Uh, so Icarian here is speaking more about himself and like thinking about like who is protecting who and what is my relationship to Mappo. What do you think it would really mean if he comes to terms with who he is, you know? Um, as someone who hasn't yet finished Dead House Gates, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're recording that episode in like a few hours. In 12 Babe. hours, we will. I will have finished Dead House Gates. I'll, I'll go to sleep and wake up to a finished Dead House Gates. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I'll, oh, there's a cat on the camera now. India's become a cat. Oh, wow. Beautiful baby. Hi. Um, but I think I, I, it can't be good, right? I just don't know. Because it seems like all this uh, adventuring that Icarium did over these hundred thousand years or whatever has been like it seems like it was him walking across the world making these time pieces and laying down prophecies mm-hmm. and i just think it's so i don't know for for whatever set him off initially like the first time that he needed to be you know memory wiped or whatever i just think it's so wild that that it outweighs the like tens of thousands of years of him walking around like just being a dude in the world yeah i'm curious what 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 it was because it can't just be like oh well he wiped out like one i I don't know i mean it's a big thing he He wiped out one civilization but like (laughs) one civilization in the context of like how big this dude's life has been doesn't seem worthy of like mind wiping him I, i i just don't know i just really don't know and also why isn't he just killed (laughs) Uh, is also another thing which makes me think maybe he can't be killed and maybe uh, I, I just don't know man I just don't know so India on the doorstep of Yucatan we catch up with the 14th uh, like last chapter we're touching on with various people in it and um, this time we catch up with the fist Kenab who thinks Leoman wants to martyr himself he speaks with Tavor Bottle is there. He has this encounter with Aerosol. We hear that Dujek and his host are not to be relied on. Which of these storylines really stood out to you from the 14th? It, I more so come with a question of why um, with Tavor. Because, I, again, I just feel like we still... There's not much going on about... Like, I don't really know much about my girl Tavor. And my question is, what happened... I wasn't fully understanding when she, like, no longer, why she no longer trusts. Who does she no longer trust? The guy, the the people who she made have the new leader. Dujek One Arm. Yeah. So what, why, what happened? Does anybody know? Like, why does she no longer trust them? Uh, I actually think it's not that. She, like, has that scene later where she reveals that it's more like she's kind of assuming a lot of like responsibility and kind of anger from her soldiers because she like they don't have a backup that's what that whole scene was about so i really think whenever uh, at this point after book four i think basically you can assume that whatever the soldiers think about tavor is probably wrong and is probably exactly what she wants them to think about her Mm -hmm. oh my gosh is what it seems like i could be very wrong we don't we don't get we don't get much one-on-one time with tavor right 
I, I think you're right, Josh, because there there is like a line where she says something something to the effect of like, I'm willing to sacrifice the respect of my army uh, for like a successful victory yeah, or something, yeah, yeah. which is something like, like that. a wild prospect. But I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty. I don't really. Yeah, that's my thoughts on mostly that. I hate I hate those parts of the book. I am so disinterested by any of the um, 14th and any of mm. anything that has to do with that. So I didn't like any of it. It's boring to me. I don't enjoy yeah. reading it. I don't I don't understand it. I don't know where they're going with it. And that's how I, I feel about that. This is this is the this is the main difference I think between me and India is that she loves the Scalara Crocus crew and I love the fucking 14th with a passion. Yeah. Mm. Definitely, Josh. Josh, I thought you were gonna say that. So yeah, well, I love all of them. I love the scene where they're like dismantling a cart and they've bound and gagged the cart drivers, just kind of because they're like, "We're tired of eating dust," and it's like, "But you're here. You made it. I don't get why you're mad now. It's so goofy." I think they yes, might have murdered those people. <laughs> no, no, no. They were bound and gagged. Bound, gagged, you, and you... motionless. It said it explicitly said motionless. Well, they wouldn't be motion full if they're bound. So true. Depends on that's how they so, That's and, so so deep, Josh. And <laughs> if they had, if you do a murder, you don't bind them afterwards, unless they can come you back. Bind as a them zombie. before and then kick the crap out of them because you're mad about eating their dust. All if right. they're if they're as unstable as they seem, that seems pretty reasonable of the things they would do. Eat I like to dust, assume my nerd. I like to assume my good good soldier buddies aren't doing casual murders to their other soldiers. But listen, why are I'm these totally your good? Why, why, Josh, why are these good buddies? We don't know anything about these people. I because I think I think Steve does such a good job of characterizing them with such little amount of work, and I don't I, like like I, if you asked me to tell you any of those traits, I couldn't right now, and I get mm-hmm. that. I get that that probably sounds bad, but I like that. I, as I'm reading a scene, I get such a vivid image of what is going on in all of these individual soldiers and their like mentalities and stuff. And I love it. I think it's sure. I, I think it's very well done. You almost AJ, don't need to know. Like, <laughs> exactly. AJ, AJ, what do you want? A, a once thief from the streets of Darugistan who we've now followed through <laughs> multiple books across continents, through all these different paths in his life or some soldiers being rude and and salty to each other. Wittershins, Wittershins, who speaks with a silly voice. <laughs> well, oh, you know, it's it's, it's 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 just a tough choice for me on these two characters here. <laughs> anyway, yeah, setting aside yeah. my good nature ripping, Josh, what what stood out to you here? Was it Keneb? Was it this talk of Dujak? Was it this strange scene with Bottle? I think it's uh well, first off, anytime Bottle's in, I'm so ready. I love it. Everything love bottle. He's, love bottle's bottle. great. Bottle's the new whatever that character was in the third book that was also highly magical and just was kind of doing their own thing. Quick uh, Ben? No, not Quick Ben. The other, like the squad mage that was like way more powerful than he ever let on with the eyelash mm. uh, shirt. Yeah, the hair shirt. Uh, the hair shirt. Anyway, um, I actually think what I like is how the book portrays this army leadership as completely different from the army we saw in Memories of Ice which I still stand by as saying that Memories of Ice is like essentially a perfect fantasy book because of like it. And that's before Steve starts doing his weird shit. And I think that this is just taking that army style of like leaders conversing, working with each other. Yes, they have their own schemes, but they're keeping everyone filled in. And then this is the exact opposite where there is one single leader. She is given the orders. She does not give a shit what you think. And that is how it's going to be. And I think it's very different. Interesting to me to like, see how that affects the everyman because like in memories of ice their concern was cannibal army not fun and things like that and this army's concern is i'm gonna murder the man next to me because i hate like the tension is so pervasive and i think it comes from this style of leading and i really like how it's such a you know the trickle down effect is just the the top guys are mad at each other the bottom guys like aj is saying might be murdering one another at night and it's just interesting to see how this whole army is interacting with each other. I like it. No, I think it's it's um it's almost like a different setting itself. The mm-hmm. differences between the different armies and the moods established within them. Yeah. And I think it's cool because we've seen that like e- like Dujak's army is broken. They did all those things well and we and you know they it felt like they did all the things right and they still ended up with a completely crushed soul. So I'm curious to see if Tavor's exact opposite style ends up working better. 
How'd you feel about that? This kind of talk about Dujak. Sad. I was so sad. I get it. You can't you can't have Whiskey Jack murdered in front of an entire army, you know, and not be broken. That sucked. I forgot about that. Yeah. Mm. And then the guy gets away by just fucking teleporting away. I fucking oh. After being the shadiest motherfucker to ever exist in a book for for months. I like how in one line in this chapter they were like, "We probably should have seen that one coming." Quick yeah, says. Yeah, it's like no fucking <laughs> shit. Of course you should have seen that one coming. He was awful the whole time. Yeah, I actually think it was a few chapters ago. But hey, Aj, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the bottle scene with Aerosol before it mm-hmm. moved on. Mm-hmm. We we saw Aerosol before when she yeah. assaults t- Troll in book four, and now here we are. What? It's such a weird, trippy scene. But what did you make of this scene altogether? Uh, I thought it was bonkers. I mean, uh, like Josh said, any scene with bottle doing stuff is like wild. It's just and who's. I'm, I'm f- Who's this voice that's not his grandmother talking right, to him? Right, yeah, when he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was the, the best little breadcrumb. It's like, oh, yeah, when I hear my grandmother's voice, if that's who it is. Um, <laughs> really good, really, really good. I don't know, and, and I was, con- so, I mean, it's, it's, sorry, Pete, this is going to be just you explaining to me this scene, but, like, where, what was, what was Bottle seeing? Like, what, what realm or what Warren or whatever was that? It was, like, time, bro. Okay. It's like, it was just like when some are weird... we? Where are we, yeah, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Got it. Um, I we're don't know. beyond. It we're weird. beyond the two dimensions, bro. You're thinking about time linearly, <laughs> man. Yeah. There was something in here that really concreted to me that like time is a flat circle and we're just all living in it at all moments at the same time. I don't remember where it was. <laughs> Oh, it's 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 a bottle. Bottle. That's what it is. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. I want to read that quote. I want to read that quote, because to me, that was like full confirmation that like we are really fucking with time here. Mm-hmm. Oh, Steve must have some there. interesting thoughts. We should ask him next time. <laughs> Steve, what are your thoughts? What is an interesting thought for you, about, sir? Tell me about time. Just give me a stream Steve. of consciousness, Steve. <laughs> Did you find the quote? I did find the quote. So the uh, he, he says earlier in, in on that same page is like, oh, she's not real. She's a manifestation or maybe I'm the manifestation. Um, so, you know, we're already in some pretty heady territory. But then, you know, he's seeing this weird place he's in and he says it's as if uh, as if all is present, as if every moment coexists. Uh, and here we are face to face, both too ignorant to partition our faith, our way of seeing the world. And so we see them all all at once. And if we're not careful, it will drive us mad. Which really is like, to me, saying that, you know, the, the crippled God lives out of time and is kind of mad uh, and that time doesn't really exist. And it's, you know, everything's kind of it's up to your perspective, you know, and your perception. So I, I don't know. I thought that was pretty, pretty good, pretty good part of that scene for me. So Inge, at the end, uh, we return to Absalar and Perrin and they learn about a plague on seven cities. And they speak more about elder gods, and then eventually they travel their own separate ways. Would you have rather them traveled together? So, I don't know if it would have, um, I don't know, I mean, would I prefer it? Yes, but that's just from like an end, wanting something, forcing something, creating something in my (laughs) head that is not a thing. Um, Shipping. It doesn't word. make sense. I don't know where, I don't know what they, Absalar is very, um, I feel like focused on what she needs to do um, for Cotillion. And she's very, you know, she wants to be, she wants to be done with that shit. So I think that it doesn't make sense for them to travel together. Although I would have thoroughly enjoyed more conversations between them. Hmm. There's a lot of conversation about elder gods in the OG make all that. Are they around? Are they helping? Are they, well, you know, eh. I think that the Elder Gods situation, I it's just one of those things that I just still don't understand. I think that they're really powerful, but also, I don't know, like the crawl one. Like, I just, it just makes no sense. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, I don't understand. I just don't understand what they do, really. Well, India Magic is his blood and Warren's are his veins, so... So, right. <laughs> you see, Warrens are simple to understand. Like that, when you put it like that, it's just so clear. Um, I thought there were only three Elder Gods after book three. I thought that's what they said. It was just Kroll, Draconis, and the other one. And I apparently really misunderstood something in that book. Because now they're like, nah, there's Elder, Elder God of Dogs? Fuck yeah, right here. Elder Dog of fucking coffee? Mm-hmm. 
And there's just so many of them. Um, yes, so I, I, well, I, you were sorely mistaken, sir. I was very, very wrong. Um, this episode's a little, 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 little loopy up. Anyway, <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's just because it's you, getting late and I'm losing my faculties. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Let's keep moving so we can get you to bed. So the final, uh, what before we get to the book's exciting cliffhanger, let's get to. Uh, you know, Kalam and them are infiltrating the Sky Keep. They go in, they're like, let's just take Stormy, and then they guess they're in them, go back to the camp, and then they get up on there, the, the Cotillion shows up, there's, you know, they, the, he heals them, they talk about Quick Ben a bit. Josh, what you make of this whole Sky Keep venture within the Imperial Warren? I was I was honestly very concerned. I thought Kal- thought Kalam was gonna was just gonna fall off. Mm. Um, I did love Cotillion just being a fucking goober. I, mm. I Like, it's so... Him from book one to now is so different. Like he is just he is just loving messing with mortals, and it's very fun to me. Uh, also, I feel like every other book, I feel like now I figured out Quick Ben, and then the next book is just like oh more surprises. So because <laughs> like we we found out two books ago the whole like oh he's got twelve warrens because he absorbed the souls of twelve fucking wizards or whatever, and now Cotillion's also just kind of like oh. And and Quick Ben's just giving him the look right back, and I I'm so curious what it all is about. If they're working together, if there's more to Quick Ben than meets the eye, Transformers. Uh, I don't know. So I think it's fun though. I like how in Guardians of the Moon they're like, let's travel by the Imperial Warren. This is Ma- our Malazan Warren, and yeah. then c- cut to it's like they were just like, I don't know. I guess this one's ours. Dibs. You yeah, know? we found it first. <laughs> Um, it's very, f- I, I know, uh, so have, I can't remember cause books, have we figured out what the Imperial Warren is? Is it part of the Shadow Warren? You know, is that what makes it so easy for them to kind of travel through? Like, would it, do we know yet? We've learned several different things about the Imperial Warren. Yeah. It's yeah. ancient. There's fucking bones of civilizations in it, but like concrete, Pete. Bones anything? of Kalor's empire. Now these right. changed small sky keeps are here. Maybe it's the future. Maybe it's the, maybe they're traveling through the apocalyptic future. Bum, ba, da, da, bum, bum, bum. I'm just trying to get as much copyrighted music in this episode as possible. <laughs> um, Odge, it's the ending. Dishman to brawl finally strikes. Oh, <laughs> oh, can I raise my hand? Raise my hand. Can I raise my hand? Can I make a quick thing? I, mm-hmm. I, I alluded to it like an hour ago. Sure. I didn't um, even. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Then I'll let you do it. It's no, no. Samar and Karsa are definitely there too, right? He, that's they're definitely going to jump in next chapter and save fucking Akarium and Mapo for sure. You think? Yeah, because they stopped by a canyon and they were like, "There's a, there's something here." And I assumed that that meant that the beast was there to kill Karsa, and then we found out it's there to kill Akarium and Mapo. But Samar and Karsa are definitely right there. My Josh uh, hot take. I don't know. And what did you think of this? cliffhanger i like that hot take um if that is the case i'm gonna freak out because because last time carson and akarium saw each other they punched each other really yeah. hard <laughs> i, I think love it. uh i don't know i think josh that they it could be whatever is coming up on the the cutter heboric scalara fellison camp because they right before this final scene we get them at camp and and everybody wakes up and and is afraid of something like gray frog senses something they wake haboric up and he's like mm. we have to go can uh, you imagine if they were also near the demon and they're we're just gonna get a big old fucking or maybe, party or maybe they sense karsa and they're afraid of karsa no, i don't well, know that could be i guess because be? because ikari and mapo when when they met karsa last time they were traveling the steps or whatever like on the yeah. by, by that waterfall uh, so i don't know how they would like re meet like i don't know how they would come back across each other because i don't know i think carson would have like passed them and then come back and they would have kept going well so now they're like we'll, doubly I guess, far apart. I guess we'll see aj i'm yeah. not good at geography so yeah, i guess pete did you want to finish your intro to this part <laughs> no my <laughs> so uh this wraps up book one of bone hunters uh <laughs> india what's your impression of the book so far it's all right. I like it. It's it's okay. We're we're. It, it, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I feel like you guys really love these chapters. For me, I was just kind of um meh about them. They kind of yeah, were, were boring fun. for me. So I didn't love it, but I push on. I really liked <laughs> the scene with Perrin and Absalar, though. I I thought that was interesting. That was good for me. Aj, uh, for, first impression of this book, book six. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say I was super hot on these chapters, but I think. As far as like the 
uh, expository chapters go of like, here's here are the players. Here's what the story is kind of going. Like, I think these first six chapters did a really great job. And I'm, you know, I'm happy again to be back with my friends, you know, all the people that I haven't seen for for uh, two books, maybe three books. Um, it's great. J-Bone? I'm with AJ. I think it does a really good job of being like, I know it was a sad book last time, but hey, remember your old pals? It does a really <laughs> good job of, of doing that. Yeah, it kind of pat, like holds your hand and pats your back through this whole first six books before we get into yeah. some really fucked up stuff, I imagine. Yes, for sure. All right, everybody. Well, that'll do us here for today on the show. Thanks for always for listening. Uh, let us know what you think of the show at 10 Very Big Books on Twitter and Gmail. And next uh, episode. It's all chapter seven. Should be a good one. Talk to you then. <laughs> See ya. Bye. 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 Hello, everybody. Producer AJ here getting ready for my second vaccine tonight. Uh, Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you'd like to give us your thoughts or feelings about this or any of our episodes, you can head on over to our Twitter at 10VeryBigBooks, or you can email us 10VeryBigBooks at gmail.com, or you can head on over to our Discord, bit.ly slash VBB Discord. That's capital V, capital B, capital B, capital D, Discord. That link will also be in our show notes. Of course, thank you to all of our wonderful patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like to pledge to our patreon you can head on over to patreon.com slash 10 very big books that link will also be in the show notes our next episode will be about only chapter seven uh, it's a big chapter literally and figuratively so we're going to make it a special one uh formatting it especially doing some special things uh, all that to say we want to hear from you what did you think about chapter seven when you first read it has what has stuck with you uh what did it make you feel whatever you want to say we want to hear it so please send us a voice memo uh it's as easy as following the link in our description and recording yourself for one minute we want to be able to put as many of you as we can on the episode uh, so please try your best to keep your thoughts brief-ish. Uh, again, that voice memo link will be in the show notes. And as always, thank you so very much to Dan Gezerick for making our spectacular logo. You can follow him on Twitter at A underscore W underscore Dan G for the hottest Hulu live sports takes. And of course, the wonderful music in today's episode is by the one, the only Amaranthin from their album Simulant Rain, which you can find along with their other music on bandcamp.com. Links to their pages will be in the show notes and 10 very big books will be back in two weeks on May 7th, where we will be discussing The Bone Hunters Chapter 7. Uh, Again, if you want to send us a voice memo, please visit that link in the show notes. I'll talk to you then. And thank you so much for listening.